You've probably heard the term big law thrown around quite a bit, and for a lot of law students, getting a job in big law right after graduation is the ultimate goal. But what exactly is big law, and what does it look like to work there? Well, that's exactly what we're going to go through in today's video, a day in the life of a big law associate. If we haven't met yet, I'm Angela Borpal of AngelaVorpal.com and the Law School Network on Facebook, and I help law students master the law school strategy to compete for top grades and to position themselves for their dream jobs out of law school. So if winning law school and building the legal career of your dreams is your goal, then be sure to hit subscribe and tap that notification bell so you don't miss any new videos. In today's video, we have with us Marissa Jeanette of The Unbillable Life. Marissa is a former big law associate turned blogger who recently published the book Behind the Big Law Curtain, How to Succeed as a Junior Lawyer in Big Law. And so I'm really excited today because you guys will be able to get a big law perspective from a litigation associate, myself, as well as a corporate associate, Marissa. So you'll be able to compare and contrast the experiences and get double the insights. So Marissa, thank you so much for being with us. Of course, thanks so much, Angela, for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, as Angela mentioned, I was a corporate associate in big law in New York for um, about eight years. I was in the corporate group, and more specifically, I was a member of the Capital Markets Group, which is one of the subgroups of our corporate group. So let's dive in with the first question. What did a typical day for you look like? So for me, um, in the corporate group, um, our business hours, well, I guess generally at the firm, our business hours were 9.30 to 5.30, but as a corporate associate, those definitely were not my hours. Um, I tended to come in a little earlier than 9.30, even though we did not have to be there earlier. Um, mostly this was for two reasons. Uh, the first was many of our clients were um, investment bankers or just in the banking industry, um, and they would start work at seven or sometimes six o'clock. So if you got to work at 9.30, you would have a whole pile of work just waiting for you um, when you got there, which could be a little stressful. Um, the other reason I tended to come in maybe 8.30, at least a couple of days a week, um, was I tried to schedule some time with the partners that I worked with. Um, you'll, you'll probably see that most partners you work with, um, either they're in the office early or they're firing away messages super early. Um, it's like the only time they can get focused time away from clients just calling them all day. Um, so if you don't catch them early, you might not have any sort of dedicated time with them. So I would tend to like schedule maybe a half hour chunk of time with them at 830 in the morning. And that helped a lot to just get all my questions like um, answered right away. So that was my morning. And, you know, a typical day would last probably if it was slow, maybe 630 p.m. I would leave. Um, and if it was busy, it could be, you know, 12 hours there, um, 14 hours, you know, you leave at midnight it was not. Um, unusual at all. And sometimes, you know, we could last until 3 a.m. It all really just depended on the day. Um, and one last thing to note, if you did work till 3, 4 a.m., you were not expected to be there, you know, at 8.30, 9.30, unless you had a call. It would be okay to come in at 10, 11, even if for some reason all of your work was um, pushed back towards a later time in the day. So interesting because we had a very different work culture in our firm. So our firm was a very late start firm. It was also in New York and people usually got into the office around 10 or 1030. And that worked out perfectly for me because I'm very much a night owl and very much prefer to start my day later than earlier. And so my typical day would be around 1015 AM to around 915 PM. So if it were normal busy, an 11 hour day is probably average. Now, if we were extra busy or if there were was a big motion or an expert report or the case got really busy, then it equally was not at all rare to work 12 hours, 14 hours, two, three in the morning. And so it definitely did depend, but I would say that being normal busy looked about 11 hours. I would also say that for people who had a family or who had kids, they would typically leave around 7.15, so maybe work 9, 10 a.m. to 7, 7.30 p.m., go home, have dinner, put their kids to bed, and then get back online on their laptop and work another two to three hours at night. So that was another way that people got all their hours in if they didn't want to be at the office doing them. I just preferred to be at the office when I was working to the extent possible because I really liked keeping that momentum going and then also being able to close the book on the day and go home and not have to worry about it anymore. Next question is, what types of projects would you have worked on as a young associate in the corporate group? Sure. So in the corporate group, there are a couple of main things that you would definitely be working on. Uh, one of them is drafting documents. 
Another is conference calls and just general calls with clients. Um, and a third is due diligence. So real quick, because you often hear what due diligence is, uh, that is basically the process that the corporate associates do to look for any material terms that are in um, the documents that the other side has given you. So you want to find all the material information that you're going to need to disclose um, either to your investors or that's relevant to your deal. So it's going to be your job as a junior associate to sift through hundreds, thousands of documents and find that information. You will hopefully be given more guidance um, based on a specific deal from your senior associates and partners as to what exactly you're supposed to be looking for and what they want from you, uh, whether it's a template, um, a summary of the document, whatever it might be. Um, with respect to drafting documents, that is a task that you're definitely going to be doing as a first year, second year, third year, and up. Um, and you'll basically be given a precedent document from a similar deal. And you're going to have to strip that um, document, uh, which maybe is a 200, 300, 400 page document of all the old terms and add in all the new terms that you know at that point. Um, and just to fill it in as best you can before you then send it off to the other side, send it off to your client to continue filling that out, revising it for your new deal. Ah, I love digging into the specifics of what people can expect because that's one of the things we don't really hear about all that often when you talk big law and new associate tasks. And so to give you guys the litigation associate perspective, it's similar in the sense that there are some big overriding projects that you will traditionally be assigned as a first, second or third year litigation associate. And I would say that the first big chunk, maybe a third of what you're doing is going to have to do with discovery. And so discovery is the process that takes up the most time and space in litigation. And that's where you are requesting information from the other side and the other side is requesting information from you. And so that generally tends to take the form of documents and depositions. And so as a young associate, Associate, you are usually going to be tasked with writing those deposition requests, so the particular type of information that you want to get from the other side, and also responding to the other side's requests. Another big piece of what you're going to be doing is case law research. So I would say that's another third of what you can expect to do. And because law students are all taught how to do basic case law research in law school, it's a really easy skill set to be able to delegate down to because they know you know how to do it. And so in litigation, there are a ton of motions that get filed. You can have a motion to dismiss, a motion to change venue, a motion to sever, a motion for summary judgment, a motion for new trial. There's all these different types of motions that can be filed. And your job will be to look up the case precedent that supports whatever argument your side wants to make. And as you get more and more senior, you will also be allowed to start to actually draft pieces of those documents. So that's another big uh, chunk of what you're going to be spending your time on. And then the last third, I would say, is divided into one of two things. One will be document review. So you may have heard of document re review. It's sort of the dreaded grunt work of a litigation associate. And so when you kind of picture what that looks like, when the other side has produced documents documents to you or when you are producing documents to the other side, that can be hundreds or thousands of documents. And before your side can actually produce those documents, they need to be reviewed by somebody and they need to be determined relevant or not and privileged or not. And so as a young associate, you're sitting there with a database, thousands of documents and you're click, click, clicking relevant or not, privileged or not. And so that's what document review looks like. And a lot of law a lot of law firms are starting to outsource that, but that likely still will be a big chunk of what you're going to be spending your time on. The last piece I would say that which starts out small but tends to grow over time is something that I would refer to as high level tasks. And any and high level tasks I would say are things like drafting a deposition uh, outline, so the Q and A of some an, a witness who's going to be deposed. Um, actually, going to the deposition and taking that deposition is a high level task. I would say drafting an entire brief, an entire motion, is also a high level task. So once they give you complete ownership over a motion or a response or a brief, I would definitely consider that a high level task. And then anything related to pre-trial work. So if when a case goes to pre-trial 
which is not very often in civil litigation. There is so much work and so many tasks that needs to be completed from jury verdict forms to direct examination outlines, cross-examination outlines, exhibits, objections, all these different pieces. And so part of that is going to be your responsibility as well. And that will start to grow over time. So those are the big chunks that you can expect when you are a first, second, third litigation associate in big law. Next question is, you hear about the high paying salaries that big law associates make when they first start out and as they make their way up the ranks. Do you remember what you first made when you started in big law and what you were making when you left? Yeah, when I first started out, um, my first year was in 2010. I started as a first year associate and I think my salary was 170, uh, my starting salary. And at the end of the year, that year, we got about a $10,000 bonus as first years. And the bonus depends. They put the bonuses out every year um, in November, December, and you'll get that um, either December, January of the year after. And those fluctuate uh, year to year, but it's generally all firms in the market get the same exact thing. Um, same with salary. I think it's about 190 now for our first year associates. And you can look that all up. It's lockstep based on first through eighth year associates. And you get what the market says. Um, when I left, I was an eighth year associate and I believe my salary was $320,000 and that year. So, which would have been for my seventh year work, I think my bonus was about a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So those numbers really get high fast. And as Marissa said, this is all publicly available information. I will link in the description below so you guys can check out what those lockstep salaries and bonuses look like. And from for me, when I was first starting out, I actually came in as a second year associate because I clerked for a judge for the first year out of law school. And so most law firms will allow you to use that year as credit towards partnership track and credit in the law firm. So I was able to come in as a second year associate and I was the same lockstep structure so I assume I was making around $175,000 per year probably with about a $15,000 bonus um, not to include the $50,000 judicial bonus on top of that which came from clerking but when I left I was actually working part-time and so I think I was making about $100 an hour at that time but if you are a full-time associate and you are at a big law firm same thing you're gonna be following that lockstep structure and everybody in the class, almost without fail, is going to make the same salary and the same bonus. So we talked about how many hours we were in the office on an average day, but how many hours did that translate into for required billable hours at your firm? My firm required 2,000 hours per year worked. Um, 1,800 of those had to be billable hours and 200, up to 200 of them could be what they called firm chargeable. Uh, you could do as many firm chargeable as you wanted, but only 200 would count towards that 2000 hour goal for the year. Uh, for us, firm chargeable was things like pro bono, which was the main bulk of what associates would do for firm chargeable hours. Uh, work on firm committees. If you were on the committee, let's say the women's committee, your work towards that would count uh, as firm chargeable or preparing and giving a CLE presentation or perhaps a law review article, things like that. Um, so if you reached your 2,000 hours, your 1,800 plus 200, or you, if you wanted, you could just do 2,000 or more billables. That also worked. I think the firm probably liked that better. Um, if you reached the 2,000 hours, you were basically guaranteed that you would be getting your bonus for the year, and you would just generally be in good standing with the firm. If you didn't hit your 2,000 hours, um, the, it would depend on why you didn't hit it. Um, if you were just below it, it probably... Um, just it happened that way. If you were way below it, the firm would probably talk to you about why. Um, but one reason is sometimes um, your group, let's say you're in the M&A group and the M&A activity is just pretty slow that year. Uh, you might not be able to get 1800 billable hours. Um, and on the flip side, what happens when you go way over 2000 billable hours? Um, at our firm, you know, if you hit the 2000, you get your year end bonus. If you go above and beyond, um, you would get something that they call the super bonus which at my firm was, um, it wasn't set in stone what that was. It was discretionary. Um, not too many people got it, but you know, if you built 2,800 hours one year, you're gonna be getting a little something extra over the people who build a very respectable 2,000. 
Yeah, and at our firm, it was a bit more stringent. So we had a yearly billable requirement of 2,400 hours per year, and that was definitely above market. So that's definitely high for big law firms. And in addition to that, none of the non-client billable time would count towards that 2,400 hours. So if we did worked on a pro bono case, if we wrote a law review article, if we managed um, or organized an internal CLE within the firm, um, firm committee work, summer associate recruiting, anything like that wouldn't count towards those 2,400 hours. And so it was pretty strict, but we also did a lot of litigation work that allowed us to be able to walk in and bill our time really, really efficiently during the day. So I don't necessarily know that that for sure translated into more hours in the office. It just may have been more billable time that was getting done during those hours. But the same topic, the same approach to bonuses that Marissa was talking about also applied for us. So if you major, if you major billable hours, 2,400 a year, you automatically got the lockstep bonus that year. If you were under 2,400 hours, but were closed, you probably wouldn't even have somebody talk to you. If you were significantly below that, then yes, there would probably be some conversation about why did you, were you not able to find cases? Did you not have a lot of work to do on them? Were you in a practice group that was slow? Was there another issue there? So that was something that was definitely highlighted if it was significantly below 2,400 hours. But similarly, if you were above 2,400 hours or significantly above 2,400 hours, then you definitely could be eligible for a discretionary bonus. So same thing, the firm could decide that they wanted to give you something extra for your additional hours. So that's also how we, we treated billables. And I think 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,200 is usually kind of the going market rate for billable hours at any big law firm. Next question is about work-life balance. So you hear about how terrible the work-life balance is in big law, but to give people a little bit more context and a little bit more perspective of what that actually looks like, can you talk about what your life outside of the law firm looked like during the week and on the weekends? Sure. Uh, this is a big question, work-life balance. Um, during the week, uh, during the work week, how it played out for me was that I generally did not schedule too many things, at least Monday through Thursday. Um, it was just so unpredictable when work would come in that it was oftentimes easier not to schedule something and then cancel. Um, unless it was something super important, which you could clear with your team ahead of time. If it was just a dinner, drinks, catching up with a friend, I tended to save those things for the weekend. Um, the reason being that there's sometimes at work at five, six o'clock or just any time of the day, you know, a new deal could come in and it would all of a sudden be like all hands on deck or a client could call and request something. And it was your turn to work on that document. And there goes your evening. Uh, that being said, I did get to do some things. It wasn't like I was chained to my desk every night during the week. A couple of things that I found that I was always able to do or almost always able to do was. One thing, um, I played on a co-ed soccer team with some of my coworkers, some of their partners, um, just some friends. And the games, this was in New York City, and the games were often, you know, the earliest one would be 7 p.m. So sometimes we'd have a game that started at 10 p.m. So it was very rare that I would have to miss that on a Wednesday night. Um, sometimes I would go to it and then work afterwards. But usually during the evenings, um, it wasn't so much that clients would be calling unless it was like in the middle of a very important part of the deal. It would more just be like, okay, before you go to bed, you have to send this document out to the partner or the client. So if you want to take a break for your soccer game at 8 p.m., you could generally do that. Um, another thing I did was I went to plenty of happy hours with my coworkers. There were, you know, lots of days where we would finish at five o'clock. And if a whole group of us were all of a sudden done, you know, it's five, six o'clock on a Wednesday, Thursday, any day, really. Um, there was like always someone to go out with and hang out with. So that was definitely a good thing. Uh, it was just harder to plan with non big law people or non um, coworkers. Um, on the weekends, I found it much easier to schedule things, uh, especially if it was like a family or a personal thing. If it was super important, I would tell my team ahead of time. Um, but generally, if it was just normal weekend stuff, I would just go about my day and check in every so often on my phone just to make sure, you know, something wasn't kind of like blowing up and I needed to get back and work on it. But that generally would not happen on a Saturday night. If you had to be working on a Saturday night, you knew you'd be working on a Saturday night. I would say that most weekends, um, I worked Sunday evening for a couple hours mostly to get ahead for the week. And as I mentioned before, I worked for a lot of investment banking clients. 
And on Monday morning, they would get there at 7 a.m. So if I had something due to them, if I could get it to them on Sunday evening and they could start looking at it, you know, early Monday morning, they would just like appreciate that so much more than me getting them the document at 11 a.m. on Monday. So it was good for both them and for me if I could just do a little bit on Sunday um, and get ahead of things. And then, of course, there were those weekends where I worked all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and so did everyone else on my team. And, you know, even when I was junior associate, sometimes I would even go into the office because it was, you know, easier to get things done. My whole team would be there and we would really just treat it like a regular work day, um, except we would be in jeans. Ah, I love digging into the work-life balance stuff. I think it's so Mm -hmm. interesting and definitely not talked about enough. And so for my big law experience, it was very similar to Marissa's in the sense that I also would not plan anything during the week that was before 9 or 10 p.m. because there was just a really good chance I wouldn't be able to make it. And also, as I mentioned before, my average workday started at 10, 15 a.m. So it stopped at 9, 15 p.m. So if I wanted to meet up with a friend or Mm -hmm. have a drink or something, I probably wouldn't schedule that until 10 or 10, 30 p.m. at night anyway. I was also a member of a volleyball team. And so if those games started late enough, I could make them. Um, I remember one of the other things that I always aim to do on a normal busy day during the week is that my gym closed at 11 p.m. So if I could leave the office by 10, I could get there by 10, 20, 10, 30, and then have an, a half hour to run before the gym closed. So that was always a goal of mine too, to sort of end the day that way. And on the weekends, it felt a lot more open and flexible. I definitely probably worked, I don't know if it was every weekend, but probably most weekends, at least a little bit, maybe three or four hours on a Saturday to get caught up from the week or get ahead for the week coming up so that I felt like I was more organized and more in control and it wasn't going to be as stressful of a week. But then of course there were those weekends where it was all day, every day, something big was coming due and everybody needed to help out with it. So that definitely, that definitely happened as well. And so I guess what I would say about work-life balance is if you definitely value big chunks of your personal time, it's going to be a strain on that. It's going to be a struggle to really balance um, and find those pockets of time, but it is doable. And I think it's just important to realize that even in your off hours, there is an expectation that you're checking your email and making sure that nothing is blowing up or coming across your plate that you need to deal with. And so that's something important to keep in mind. And um, it sounds like we both had a very similar experience. And so that's something that you can kind of take as, um, as, as a little bit of insight and perspective into what to expect in big law. Next, let's talk war stories. So was there ever a time in your years in big law where you had a horrific professional experience? Um, So by the time I was a second year associate, I worked almost exclusively for two partners. And while they worked a ton and demanded a ton from us, they were also just like genuinely very nice people um, and very respectful. So if you worked hard and you told people in advance and you got someone to cover for you, you could take your time off. So thankfully, I do not have any, you know, horror stories about, you know, missing my best friend's wedding or anything like that, that you do hear about in big law and like definitely does happen. Uh, thankfully, it just didn't happen to me. The, the worst thing I guess I would say that happened is I had a three day trip planned to Napa with friends one year and our just deal was going so crazy that I had to cancel it. Um, my friends went, I just couldn't go. Um, and, you know, it wasn't great, but it was not the end of the world either. Uh, generally speaking, my, um, I guess my one tip, one piece of advice would be to, you know, find a team that you work with over and over and that covers for each other because, um, just find, you know, if you can find someone who, when they go on vacation, you know, you work 20 hours to, a day to cover their thing when it's their sister's wedding, they're definitely going to reciprocate and do the same for you. So, it's better to, you know, kind of do those like really hard times when you're just sitting at the office anyways and allow your teammates to um, go have their time away and they'll do the same for you. So find some people like that that you can work with and you'll definitely kind of avoid those horror stories. And that's such good advice. Absolutely. A supportive team, great partners to work for go such a long way in making for an enjoyable big law experience. And I guess I would say in terms of war stories, I have a few 
Um, I don't know where they rank on the the scale of, of horrificness or not, but for example, I was yelled at by a partner in front of the entire team at trial, which was not an amazing experience. Um, I have been thrown under the bus by a partner before, so blamed for a really big mistake in a case and have that, that blame communicated to a client when it was not my fault. I had a partner who would consistently withhold information from me before a client meeting so that when I went in, I would look uninformed and unprepared, so that was pretty nuts. Um, so those are some of the biggest ones, I guess. I didn't have um, a crazy bad experience of missing anything important, personal or family or anything like that. I would also strategically um, plan my vacations for when big cases would settle or we would finish with trial. And so that's when I would take sort of huge chunks of time off. And so I I was very successful in being able to avoid the emails every half hour while you're on vacation. That's a terrible experience. And I personally did not have that, which was great. Um, there was definitely, you know, I think for both of us, we've had instances where we have worked more than 24 hours at a time. So you walk in at 9, 10 in the morning and you don't leave until the next day. And that's definitely not unheard of in big law. But yeah, nothing like having to shower at work or sleep at work or anything like that. So you'll hear different words stories that are out there and I don't doubt that they're true but also I think on the regular you don't need to be afraid that that's going to happen um, on a daily basis. And the last question we're going to talk about today, why did you leave Big Law? I left Big Law basically because I just got burned out. Um, it had been too much of a grind for too long for me. And I just didn't see myself being able to sustain it for the long run or really wanting to. Um, I left when I was an eighth year associate. And at that point, it was time that, you know, I was having these conversations with the partners I worked for um, about putting me up for a partner and what that process was like. And, you know, basically the commitment that I, you know, what I would be committing to if I did want to go for that. And I just, it wasn't something I wanted. I didn't enter big law thinking that I wanted to make partner. Uh, I basically stayed because I mean, honestly, I was good at it. I genuinely liked the people I worked with. Um, I more or less liked the work um, that I did, but I was never passionate about it. I worked in structured finance and I didn't even know what structured finance was before I started working in big law. So it was never like this big interest of mine. Um, so it was just burnout. I think I would have left uh, way sooner, probably like mid-level associate, junior associate, if um, I had been working for terrible people um, or if like just the work environment was was so bad. But, you know, after eight years, it just ultimately got to me the not being super passionate about it and just the grind of all the hours and the prospect of that was going to be it forever, um, which is not true because you can be partner and then leave. But in my mind, it was, you know, that big next step that I just didn't want to make. So uh, I left. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it is always so interesting to hear kind of people's exit stories so that people in similar positions can get a sense for whether they resonate with that or not. And for me, the reason I left looked very different. So I also didn't have necessarily have plans to meet partner when I started. I think I, it was one of those things where I never made up my mind either way. And I was just wanting to see kind of how it went and if I continued to enjoy it and make that decision later down the line. But when I left, even though there were a lot of professional and personal reasons that I did leave, the biggest one that really started me thinking about leaving was the type of work I was doing. And specifically, I, I really liked litigation. I loved the process. I think it's creative and challenging and interesting and really pushes you to your potential. And I loved all of those pieces to it. And I got the highs on depositions and oral arguments in court and all of those great things. Um, but what I hadn't anticipated was that when I was um, beginning my seventh year, associate year, I was starting to become known as an IP litigator, which makes sense because that, those were almost exclusively the types of cases I had been working on. But that sort of identity wasn't something that I intentionally made for myself. And when I realized that's what I was becoming known for, I also kind of took a step back and thought, is that something that I really want to do with my career being an IP litigator specifically? And at the time, the answer was absolutely no. Like I was never truly 
or specifically interested in IP. Again, the litigation process was the thing that was more interesting to me. And the thing that really hit this home, this realization home for me, was that the other associates on my teams would be sending out industry news. So just sending out emails about blog posts or articles or judicial opinions in related cases, things like that. And I would never read them because I wasn't interested in them. But it finally hit me that these people are reading this stuff in their off hours and they are really, truly excited and interested in this. And they're totally nerding out on IP. And, and at that point was when I realized I want to find the thing that I can nerd out on, that I'm reading in my off hours, that I'm energized and excited by. And the thing that just kept coming back to me over and over was this six week internship I had during my 1L year and during the summer and it was with a human rights organization and specifically working with immigration law and asylum cases. And so even though I intended to do asylum cases pro bono when I was at the law firm, it never happened. Zero times that I ever um, actually take steps to do it because something would always come up with work. There was always a reason not to. And so that was the thing that got me started thinking about leaving was I want to see what else I can do with my law degree and see if I can find a way to fuse the litigation process with a subject matter area that really excited me and interested me and that I really felt connected to. All right, guys, so that's the Big Law Breakdown. I hope this video was helpful. Marissa, thank you so much for joining us. And if people want to reach out to you and ask you any questions, how can they find you? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Angela. This was super fun. Uh, really hope it was helpful for any law students or big law associates out there. Um, if you want to contact me, you can find me at theunbillablelife.com is my website. You can email me at marissa at theunbillablelife.com or find me um, on Instagram at theunbillablelife. Perfect. And thank you again so much. And thank you guys for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.